I was reading a New York Times article this past week written in 2007. Remember, 2007 is a really long time ago, about 15 years ago. This is before social media has really taken off like it has now. This is before Instagram. It's before things like Venmo, YouTube at this point, uh, the biggest website in the entire world. YouTube is only two years old, just a fledgling little uh, video service with cat videos playing keyboards, you know. Uh, It had not taken off by this point. But in this article, they talked about 45 years ago, the average person saw about 2,000 ads a day. That is insane to think about. That You would see 2,000 advertisements every single day. But, now remember, this is before social media t- uh, took off, really. Now we had MySpace, but, you know, that was just a bunch of emo kids. Um, uh, in 2007, though... 5,000 ads per day on average. So uh, within a few decades, it had uh, over doubled. Now, the question I had was, well, I bet (laughs) that is way higher now. What are the average ads that we see on a given day? And that is about 10,000 ads in a given day. So between 2007 and 2022, about 15 years, we have doubled the amount of ads we see a day. And we don't even hardly see it anymore. It's just as you're scrolling, right? You're driving down the interstate or you're watching TV or a YouTube video or uh, whatever, you see these ads. And half the time, if you are a YouTuber like I am, I love uh, watching YouTube, half the time like the ads are secretly embedded in the videos and you don't even know it. They just catch you off guard and you're like, oh, I'm watching an ad halfway through. So um, anyway, we see so many ads a day and that is bad news because ads make you unhappy. This came from researcher Andrew Oswald. The Harvard Business Review interviewed him about his study that connected unhappiness to the ads that we see a day. He went and studied a million European citizens, him and his team, over 27 countries in a span of 30 years, from 1980 to 2011. What he did is he compared uh, the satisfaction of a country to the amount of money spent on ads in that country. And he found an inverse connection between ads and people's happiness. That the more money that was spent on ads in a country, the less happy the people were on average. He concluded that ads make us unhappy. And why? Why do advertisements make us unhappy? Well, because there's this pervasive message. If you want to be happy, if you want to find the good life, get more, acquire more, uh, accumulate things, have it all there. And and these days, I don't know, you know, no no judgment because I do it too, but like the first thing I do when I turn off my alarm on my phone is I end up looking at my phone. And statistics say that you do too. It's the first thing you look at in the morning. And so we are inundated with ads from the time we wake up to the time we go to bed. Saying things like, you can't have the good life unless you get that new iPhone, because I heard on the new iPhone they're taking out the notch and they're putting a punch in the middle, like a little, like Android's had for like, I don't know, three years or something. They're catching up, you know? Uh, You know, or you can't, you know, I know you have AirPods, but have you heard of AirPod Pros? Oh, I'm not going to be happy until I have those AirPod Pros. Or uh, drink this beer and have the high life. Uh, Live in this place and you can... um, be satisfied and be this beautiful kind of Pleasantville type place to raise your family and and all this or send your kids to this school and you will be satisfied and culture screams at us over and over again with this message it is more blessed to get it is more blessed to get but here comes Jesus He comes along and he always, what he does is he gets the culture and he just kind of turns it upside down, shakes it up a bit and really makes things uh, a little uh, confusing at times. Counterintuitive for sure, but ultimately good. And this is what Jesus says in his extraordinary upside down way. He says, it is more blessed to give than to receive. It is more blessed to give away than to get and hold and accumulate. 
In fact, you will be more happy, more fulfilled, and more blessed if you give, not get, and honestly, getting, if you've ever said, oh, if I just get this thing, if I just get this degree, or I get to here, I get this thing, I will be happy. Whenever you get there, you never are. And half the time, it can lead to sadness because you thought you would be, and again, it failed. Now, one thing I know about a lot of you guys is you love to give. Um, many of you in the room are, are uh, very generous people. You love to give, but there's others in the room that you want to give more you want to be a generous person, but you're honestly at a point where you just feel like you can't really be generous. And so what I want to do today is I want to talk about how all of us, regardless of our socioeconomic status or what, can be generous. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, today bless this word to our hearts that we could understand and not just uh, hear it, move on, but God, I pray that it would move deep into us, it would change us, that we could become the type of people that you want us to be. Lord, the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our Lord stands forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, we've been in a series called Predecide, and we talked about that the quality of our decisions determines the quality of our life. We make our decisions, and our decisions end up making us in the end. And so if our life is always going to follow the decisions that we make for good or for bad. And the problem is for most of us, and, I've, and I'm going to give you some more examples today, including myself, not great decision makers. We, we uh, just aren't always making the best decisions. So we came up with this, um, this uh, equation of sorts, and it said this, and this is what we've been doing for the past several weeks. It says this, when faced with blank, whatever the situation is, when faced with blank, I have pre-decided to... Blank. So you may say, you can put whatever you want in here, but here's another example. When faced with the impulse of uh, buying off of Amazon again, doing an impulse buy off of Amazon again, I have pre-decided that my best friend holds my password, and I'm going to let them order it for me rather than me order it, because I know I have a weakness in this area. And so what we did is we said we want to see what we value in life and then what we uh, where we struggle in life and where those two things connect, and it's going to be different for all of us, where those two things intersect, those are the places where we need to predecide. So we've been through all kinds of different things. We've talked about temptation and, and fighting sin, uh, the ways we hurt ourselves, hurt others, and ultimately hurt God. We said how we can fight against the devil in those things. We talked about being a consistent person. How can we actually be consistent in our lives? We looked at being a devoted person to God, that we would go deeper and know God greater. Next week, we're going to be talking about being faithful, and finally, we will finish up with being a finisher, getting to the end and finishing well. But today, we're going to pre-decide to be generous. Why? Why do we need to pre-decide something like this? Well, this is one of those occasions where our values, we want to be generous, but where we struggle, meet up, and so we want to pre-decide because no one has ever become generous on accident. We just don't fall into generosity. It is something that we have to try to do. We never accidentally stumble into tithing. We don't, oh, oops, I paid their rent for them, you know. Uh, oh, no, I bought groceries for that whole family accidentally. No, it is something that we have to choose to do. But one thing I know is that um, most of us want to be generous. We don't feel like we can. And we think to ourselves, because I've been here, am here in a, in a lot of ways, if I had more, I would give more. If I could afford to give, I would give. It may be surprising to you that that's not how generous people think. Generosity isn't about what you have or what you don't have, but it comes down to a heart and a spiritual issue. Let me give you a for instance here. Um, I'll just go ahead and preface this story by saying that I'm uh, not a perfect person, so uh, we're just going to put it there. But when I lived in Charleston, South Carolina, I worked for Papa John's Pizza as a delivery driver. We had, at one point, the largest delivery area of any Papa John's in the entire country because the, the, the um, city where we were just exploded in growth over the course of about uh, 10 years, and so they couldn't keep up and build Papa John's fast enough. So we had this massive area. Well, there was this one neighborhood. It was uh, extremely rich, you know, mansions and all this stuff, 
Um, but it was also apparently where all the bad tippers in the world congregated to buy houses. Uh, and there's about 20,000 people in these mansions of houses. And there was one mansion, you know, the farther you go back in the neighborhood, the, the richer it gets, right? And so there's one mansion right off the creek in the very back. And I got a delivery to them. It was about $100 worth of pizza. I guess they're having some sort of party or something, and I'm delivering out to them. Now, um, let me put this map up on the screen. I blocked out the address so that you guys don't go hunt them down or anything, but this is, I, I remember. <laughs> so this is where it is. So it's, it's one of these houses in this, on this, uh, this cul-de-sac. But anyway, so if you look, that trip is 11.2 miles from the Papa John's where I work. So that means it is a 22 mile round trip to get to this place and back with about $100 worth of pizza. Now, as I approached the house, I realized that she had ordered two Coca-Colas. And guess what? I did not bring them with me. I was like in horror. I was thinking to myself, oh no. I traveled all this way and I don't have the Coke. So I'm trying to like think of a story, not a, like how I'm going to get her her Cokes and I know she's going to ask for them and all this stuff. And I'm thinking. And I walk up to the house I remember at this point, the woman does not know that I have forgotten her Coca-Cola yet. And she has written out a check. If you don't know what a check is, go look it up on Wikipedia. <laughs> it is a paper thing that you write numbers on and you give money to people. And your account numbers are out in the open for everybody to see. It's kind of crazy. But anyway, it's a thing. And uh, I'm, I'm sure I'm just kidding with you guys. You know what a check is. But she hands me a check. And she had pre-decided, before I even walked up to that door, she had pre-decided to be cheap. She... <laughs> She had written a, almost $100 worth of pizza. She had written the check over, forget this, 45 cents. <laughs> I got the check. And this was, this was a moment where I needed Jesus to work on me. I was like, okay, I know I forgot her Cokes, but she only tipped me 45 cents. And I had this moment. I was like, I'm not going to get her a Cokes. And then I had an idea, a terrible, wonderful idea. I said, you know what? I will get her her Cokes. I'm going to go to the gas station down the street, and I'm going to find the hottest Cokes that I can possibly find, the ones that they put in the back of the gas station next to the refrigerators while the heat is, like, pouring out of the refrigerators, and I'm going to get those Cokes. And so I go in there. I get two of the hottest Cokes that I can possibly find, and I'm not done yet. I get into my car, and I'm just boiling. Remember, I'm a work in progress, guys. I'm not saying this is good or you should do this, but this is what happened. I am boiling. And I realized I have a Sharpie in, I have a Sharpie in my glove box. And I pop open my glove box and I write a message on one of the Cokes. And this is what I write on this, one of her Coke bottles. I said, if you're not going to tip, pick up your own pizza. Put it in the bag. I walk up to her door. I knocked on the door. I'm 20 years old at this point, you know. Anyway, so I hand her the bag. She grabs it and I run because I have, I, you know, I was terrified that she would read it before I could uh, get out of there. And so I run, and, I'm, and I'm, I'm gone. And I'm so nervous at this point. And then nothing happens. I'm like, oh, okay, wow, okay, wow. A couple of days later, I come into work, and there is an empty Coke bottle sitting on the counter at the front, and my manager's hand is on top of it. And there is my message written across it. He goes, he knows. I mean, he knows I wrote it. He knew who was scheduled. He knew who got that pizza. He looks at me, and he says, did you write this? I'm like, oh boy, what do I do here? I said, yeah, I, I definitely wrote it. He started laughing, actually. He said, you can't do that. And then he says, but don't worry, I've uh, knocked that cheap lady out of the system. We're not going to deliver to her anymore. And I said, hey, awesome. And then they eventually ended up uh, building a Papa John's just to serve Park West because it was so far out. So I guess in a way, uh, I, I ended up winning that whole thing. I felt vindicated. But anyway. I didn't look a lot like Jesus that day. I am a work in progress, no doubt, but that lady was in a mansion, tipped about 45 cents. And so generosity isn't about how much you have. That she couldn't give the poor delivery driver, college student delivery driver, a $5 tip to travel 22 round miles. It's a heart issue. You've seen poor people that are stingy, but you've seen poor people that are incredibly generous. Almost embarrassingly generous, right? You've seen rich people that are, you couldn't squeeze more than 45 cents out of, right? But you've also seen rich people that just 
give and give and give. Now, if there's any rich people in here today or watching online, we need $2 million to buy this building, so you can just write the check out. Uh, <laughs> anyway. But seriously, yes, okay. Um, but we have to learn to be not just generous when we have enough. We have to learn to be generous now. Because if we aren't generous now, we won't be generous later. There's a story that Jesus tells about a rich man. And this rich man in Luke chapter 12 has a bumper crop. He just has the uh, unbelievable, uh, it was an unexpected crop. And he has so much. And let me tell you what this rich man doesn't do when he gets more than he expected to get. He doesn't get it. He doesn't say, you know what I'm going to do with all this extra grain? I'm going to sell it off and I'm going to support the, uh, the uh, home for widows down the street. And I'm going to give money to single moms that need it. I'm going to provide a formula for that struggling family that can't get it. I'm going to pay my workers a living wage. I'm going to go to that church in Jamaica Plain and pay off all the college debt of all the people in the church. Amen? Would you guys say yes? Okay. Amen. But that is not what he did. He did who he already was. This is what Jesus says he did. I will do this, he said. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones and store all my grain and my goods there. Then I'll say to myself, you have many goods stored up for many years. Take it easy. Eat, drink, and enjoy yourself. Money does not make you more generous. Money only makes you more of who you already are. The big thought for today is, if you want to be generous when you have more, you have to pre-decide to be generous when you have less. So today, through God's power, not on our own, because I know my heart, and maybe you know your heart too, you're going to need God's help in something like this. Let's pre-decide to be generous today. I want to look at two qualities of generous people. The first quality is this. Generous people plan to be generous. Generous people plan to be generous. Listen, um, you know, maybe you thought that generosity is just randomly blessing people, and that's good. You know, the guy on the side of the street, give him some money. Maybe you're driving through the uh, stoplight, and you have people that have the buckets for the homeless and stuff, and give money. That's all good stuff. You should continue to do those things, but that is... Um, you know, that's, uh, that, that's giving, and it's, it's good, but it's not generosity. Most of us end up seeing a sad story, or we, watch the, we watch, see the Sarah McLaughlin video with the dogs and uh, the, the um, you know, uh, what, what's the song? Um, In the arms of an angel. Yeah, yeah. And we're like, oh, man, i got to help those poor puppies. Good, help them. That's, that's a great thing. Keep, keep helping them. You know, we see a fundraiser or some... Preacher gets up, and he makes us feel guilty about not getting or something, and we give a spontaneous gift because of it, but that's not giving. It's good, but it's not giving. I mean, excuse me, that is giving. Excuse me, that is giving. It's good, but it's not generosity. Generosity is different. Generosity is planned, because generous people aren't guilted or inspired to be generous. They aren't reactive, or they aren't manipulated to give more. They aren't just giving when they have extra or when they've been prompted to. They have a plan with what they're going to do with their money. They're generous people. They plan ahead. Isaiah 50, uh, excuse me, 32, 8 says this. But generous people plan to do what is generous, and they stand firm in their generosity. I love that idea. Standing firm in generosity. You know, I have a tendency not to be generous, but I have chosen. I am a generous person, and so I am going to be generous in this instance. I'm not going to wait till I have more. I'm not going to uh, keep making excuses because generosity is not what I do, but it's who I am. I have pre-decided to be a generous person. Every one of us in this room, all of us have a financial plan. It may not be a good financial plan. It may not even be written down, but all of us have a financial plan. And most of us plan to just consume. We plan to get because that's oh, it's the world we live in. 10,000 ads a day. You find happiness by getting these things, right? Um, recently, I already talked about it. I'm really excited about it. I rode it to church today, uh, and it was beautiful. I bought an e-bike um, because I'm lazy and don't want to go up my hill. Um, uh, but anyway, I bought an e-bike, 
super stoked about it. But when I was, I was researching, I planned out getting this e-bike, right? I, I planned to spend, and I researched. I tried to see if there's a place I could, you know, get it for a better price. I looked at reviews and all these things. I saved. I sold stuff off. I planned to consume. And many of us have some sort of plan we plan to consume or sometimes we just don't plan what we're going to do with our money we spend more than we make we lack margin in our budget and we can't give and we just go through worry and we start the cycle over every single month can we make it now i just want to make a caveat here there's two types of people um and both of these groups of people can be generous but i just want to make sure I'm, i'm clear on this there are families that uh, where a mom and a dad or a mom or a dad or, or, or whatever, they're working two jobs, just a piece to make the ends meet. They are trying their hardest, just they are, they are saving every penny. They're not overspending and they are just barely making it by. I do believe that that person can still be generous. But there's a second type of person, and this is really kind of the person I'm talking to. This is where many of us fall today is that we can't out earn our spending stupidity does that make sense like we are spending at a rate and can't earn enough money in order to make up for the rate that we are spending we don't have a money problem as much as we have a spiritual problem we trust things to make us happy over god to make us happy and so both i think both groups can be generous in different ways but one group in particular of which i am more of Uh, is the type of group that has to learn to trust God for happiness rather than just more and more things. So generous people are built different, and they break the cycle of the perpetual, like, I'm just not going to have enough. Am I going to be able to make it? They don't plan to consume, but they plan to give. Now, the Bible gives us a strategic way to do this, and, and, and we can prayerfully design our lives around this. And This is what Jesus says. He says, seek first. The very first thing we do in our budget at the beginning, and this is maybe a good exercise for some people. At the top of your budget, I want to glorify God with my life, right? Seek first the kingdom. And then the budget comes after that. Don't seek first those new shoes or that new phone or, you know, getting that thing or or whatever it may be. Uh, Seek first. First, the kingdom and his righteousness and all of these things will be provided for you. The things that you really need in life will be provided if you seek first his kingdom. There's a powerful tool in the scriptures. And God designed it to help us be generous. And it's called the tithe. Ah! I knew it was coming. I knew it. Every time. Every time I come to church, somehow they're talking about money. If that's actually true, maybe, maybe take that as a clue from God. But anyway, we, we don't talk about it that much. But, you know, and this, every time I do talk about it, hey, listen, I'm not here to get more people to give money today. Um, and if, uh, if you don't trust us with your money, totally like, I get it. Um, you may not even know us. That's fine. And if you don't want to give to us, that's fine. But I will say this, that you need to give somewhere. The generosity is not just something that I, uh, you know, I'm, I don't make more money if you give more money. You know, we, we have a team that sets all that stuff um, for my salary and Matt's salary and all that stuff. Anything we get goes to do more ministry. So all that said, though, it, you know, this is not about getting you to give today, but it's about creating a life, predeciding a life of generosity. Because if I just get you to give today, you might give $100 and then go on with life, but that's not generous. That's a spontaneous, manipulated gift. And so that's not what the goal is Today, but there's a powerful tool, and here it is, Malachi 3.10. Bring the full tenth, that is the tithe. Some actually translations you may read today say tithe. Bring the full tenth into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house. That is his house of worship, that is the temple. Test me in this way, says the Lord of armies. See if I will not open the floodgates of heaven and pour out a blessing for you without measure. Now, 10% of what you make, is crazy (laughs) to give away. I totally get that. When Allie became a Christian and she informed her parents that she was going to have to give 10%, that God had called her to give 10% of what she made at Chick-fil-A, her parents were like, that's crazy. You can't do that. That's not right. And then when we got married and had kids and all this stuff, they actually thought that us giving 10% of what we made was immoral, that it was wrong for us 
to do. And I know you're thinking, maybe you're thinking that in order to do that, like give 10%, I'd like have to rearrange my entire life around God and I'd like have to like put things in different priorities. And it's kind of the point. Like that is, uh, 10% is enough money in our lives that if we're going to be generous with the 10%, it's going to have to be strategic. You can't just do that unless you're independently wealthy. You're thinking maybe it's impossible. And so it's almost as if the God of the universe that knows all things knew that you were going to say, it is gonna, it's impossible for me to make ends meet and make 10%. And this is the only time in all of the scriptures where God says, test me. Test me. Give and see if, what does he say? See if I will not open the floodgates of heaven and pour out a blessing for you without measure. Test me in giving 10% of your income away. Now, I'm not saying today that if you tithe and begin to tithe, if you begin to be generous with your money, that God is going to make you rich. That is, like, not what I'm saying at all. I know people all over the world um, that tithe and are not rich. That is not the point. But what you see, this is no, like, multi-level marketing scheme. You give this much, you'll get this much, you know, whatever Thing. No, this is, this is that you'll see that God proves himself faithful when you trust him. It is going to take a step of faith. God proves himself faithful when you trust him. When you give God your first and your best and trust him with the rest, God will come through. So we have to pre-decide to make a plan. We start with a tithe, and it grows from there. It's not accidental. Um, I, I, you can get creative with this, though. I actually know a pastor, of a pastor, I don't know him personally, but I know of a pastor who reverse tithed, meaning that he had this massive book that sold millions and millions of copies, and rather than keeping all the money, what he did is he paid back his church for every dime of salary they had ever given him, which is amazing. And then he took 90% of the proceeds and, and, and gave it back to the church and started a, uh, a, a charity for helping um, it, with AIDS in Africa. And so he only kept 10%. So he reversed tithe. He gave away 90 and kept, he kept 10. So, you know, if you're in that situation, maybe you can do something along those lines. But I have also a friend, maybe this is a little more uh, where you are, a friend that gave a tithe, and then on top of the tithe, they put in their budget line item $50 to give away every single month. And that could, you know, to buy someone a burrito. It could be to uh, give money at the corner or maybe get somebody a haircut. Uh, sorry. It starts to get warm, the fire alarms start going off, so we can go put that somewhere. Apologize. Uh, nothing is probably on fire. If it is, Matt will come out here and tell us. So, um, uh, so anyway, so, uh, you know, get, get uh, uh, let's see, creative. That's the word I'm looking for. Uh, I had a pastor friend who increased his tithe by 1% every year, and he was up by the time I came to the church and started ministering there. He was up to, like, giving 15% of his income uh, to church and missions every single year. Um, we had a family just recently who tithed on their tax return, <laughs> which is uh, crazy. They tithed on their tax return. And I can tell you this family is not a wealthy family by any stretch. Um, we have church supporters that tithe on their, um, their business's profits. So there's different ways that you can get creative with uncommon generosity. There's another one that I thought was really interesting, and this goes away from the money side of it, but there's someone that said because they want to have a generous heart, they want to be a generous person, they, when they get one, they give one. And they said they started with shirts. They'd get one shirt, they'd give one shirt away, and, and uh, people, you know, loved it. He's like, I was buying a lot of shirts, and so I get a shirt, I give one. I always have the same amount of shirts in my closet, but then he decided to one-up it. He said, I get a couch, I give a couch. Awesome. You know, if, if that's you, you, maybe talk to me. Uh, I, get a, <laughs> I get a couch, I give a couch. I get a refrigerator, I give a refrigerator. And then he got all the way to his car, and he said, I get a car, and I sell a car for a fair price. And he said, you yeah, know, I don't know if that's generosity or not. And so he said what he ended up doing is he got a car, he got it detailed, he filled it up with gas, and he ended up giving it to a single mom who was in need. Get creative about how to be generous. So generous people plan generosity, but second uh, uh, characteristic of a generous person is generous people round up. This is what Proverbs 21, 25 through 26 says. It says, a slacker's craving will kill him because his hands refuse to work. 
He is filled with craving all day long. One, that's that, that more sense. I want more, right? But the righteous give and don't hold back. We see this over and over again in the scriptures. The good Samaritan who finds a man on the road. He picks him up. He doesn't just take him to, um, he doesn't just take him to uh, the, the hotel to get care or anything like that. He takes him there. He gives him oil. He bandages his wounds. He pays his bill. And then he says this. The next day he took out two denarii. Gave them to the innkeeper and said, take care of him. When I come back, I'll reimburse you for whatever extra you spend. He was willing to go the extra mile. Maybe you've heard of Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was a wee little man and a wee little man was he. Did anybody ever sing that in Sunday school class? Climbed up top to a sycamore tree because the Lord he wanted to see. I'm the only one? Okay. Well, anyway, we sang that often. Anyway, so G Zacchaeus was a crook. Um, and he was... Uh, uh, he sees Jesus coming by, and Jesus says to him, I'm coming to your house today. And Jesus changes his life. And Zacchaeus doesn't just give back to the people he'd stolen from, but he gives more. Listen to what Zacchaeus says after his heart has been changed. But Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, Look, I'll give half of my possessions to the poor, Lord. And if I have ex extorted anything from anyone, I'll pay them back four times as much. He rounded up. Matthew 5, 39 through 41, Jesus tells this. He says, I tell you, don't resist an evildoer. On the contrary, if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other to him also. For as, the, for, um, as for the one who wants to sue you and take away your shirt, let him have your coat as well. Even if they bring you to court, tip them. <laughs> round up if they bring you to court. All right. If anyone forces you to go one mile, round up and go. I added the round up. It's not there. But... Go with him too. Be generous. Allie, my wife, one of the most generous people that I know, uh, almost like crazy, too crazy generous, you know, at times. Um, she's a good tipper. I, you know, I tip accordingly. Like I, I, I have a percentage that I tip. I try to tip pretty high, you know, that kind of thing when I, when I tip because of, you know, everything I just told you. But Allie is a little ridiculous. She, she doesn't just tip, but she like rounds up and then like keeps rounding up. She rounds up to the closest 10%. So if it's like, I'm like, all right, 20% will be this, that, and the other. She's like, all right, let's give them 30. Or sometimes I'm like, she'll like just pull out a wad of cash and she's like putting it on the table. And I go, Allie, that's like 60% of the bill. You know, we go out to eat with that again. She's like, they deserve it. She says, I don't tip on who they are. I tip on who I am. And I feel really guilty, you know. Um, <laughs> And she gives this amazing tip, uh, ridiculously generous. If she ends up bringing you a meal at some point, just be prepared. She's probably going to bring dessert too because she rounds up. Um, if she gives you a gift card to go out on a date or something like that, uh, just, she's probably going to you know, say, hey, I'll keep your kids too so you can go out on the date. Um, this past week, we had a circumstance where someone we know in another part of the country uh, was you know, there's a whole baby formula shortage, and wow, okay, it's it, kind of crazy. I didn't really even know about it because it's not the situation that we're in. And this person was talking about it to me, and I said, oh, my word, I, you know. I told Allie, she goes online, finds some place here that does have baby formula, and ends up sending it to this people. And, uh, and as you know, if you've ever bought baby formula, that stuff is not cheap. It's just her heart and who she is. She rounds up. Generous people make a plan. And believe me, she does most of our budget too. Um, but, and so she makes a plan for this stuff. Generous people make a plan. They round up. I want to tell you as we close out about a Mexican pig. <laughs> um, a few years ago, uh, Maggie was just a little, little girl, maybe about a year old. We went to Mexico on a mission trip. And we went to a pretty impoverished village. Um, but inside that village uh, was a Bible school that was uh, training up people to be missionaries around the world. It was an awesome, awesome place. Met some wonderful people there. They took such good care of us while we were there. And um, we were going, we were painting walls. We actually build, built them a hen coop so they could get the eggs from the uh, chickens. They could end up selling them and using them and all kinds of stuff. And we did this stuff while we were there. There was this little pig, or little pig, he's a thick boy. Um, there was this pig, and uh, he was like a petting zoo. We would um, pet him every day, and we'd feed him some food the past the there was a pastor there who owned the pig and he said he would give us food to feed the pig we feed him a big 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 old boy one day this uh 
pastor says, hey, my wife's going to cook tacos. You guys come over to the house. We'll eat tacos. And we go, awesome. Sounds great. So we come over to the house. We eat tacos. Honestly, I'm, I have never eaten a taco that good in my entire life. It was the absolute, <laughs> some of you guys know where I'm going. Um, <laughs> it was the absolute best taco I had ever had. It was, you know, we, after it's all over, we leave. We go back to our dorms and, and go to sleep for the night. We get up the next morning to do some more construction work, and we notice that the pin is empty. And we go, Pastor Benito, where did the pig go? And he just, he didn't speak much English. He just goes like this and rubs his stomach. And um, there's like 20 of us almost. And our, our guide says to us in, in translator, he says, yeah, he had been, f- knew you were coming. He had been feeding that pig and fattening that pig up. And he, uh, he, he planned ahead. You know, this, I'm adding this part. But he essentially planned ahead and then he rounded up, right? And man, I was like, oh my word, this guy that we came to bless, we came to give, he has so much less than I do. And yet he was generous to us. We would have been happy with going over there and eating beans and rice, you know. (laughs) It would have been fine. He went above and beyond, and we were blessed. God's changing my heart so that hopefully I can be a more generous person like Ali, a more generous person like Pastor Benito. I'm not as generous as I want to be. And my problem isn't money, but my problem is a heart issue. It's a spiritual issue because generous, generosity as a follower of Christ isn't what we do. It is who we are. Maybe today you want to say, I want to be a generous person. So what I'd say for you today, if that's where you are today, I want to be a more generous person. I'm going to ask you to pray. Because I don't think that you can do it on your own. It's not just something that you can will. We all need our hearts to be changed. Let the Spirit make us a generous person today. Why? Why are we generous? Why is it a Christian distinctive, should be at least, a Christian distinctive to be generous? And that is because our God is a giver. He's generous. The most famous verse in all of the Bible is this. For God loved the world in this way. He, what does it say? He gave his one and only son. He didn't have more. This is it. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. He gave you Jesus so that you could have life. (laughs) That's rounding up. And Jesus, when he comes in reflection of his Father, the perfect reflection of his Father, gives all of himself on the cross for you. He doesn't hold back anything. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 tells us this. For you are saved by grace, which is another word for a gift. You are saved by grace through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is God's gift. Not from works, so that no one can boast that you cannot do anything yourself to find salvation, that God gives it freely to you and says, here, the question I have for you today is will you choose to receive that gift, the gift you can't earn? That Jesus went on the cross for you. He died in your place for your sin. He rose from the dead, proving that he had the authority to do that, and today he offers that to you. And perhaps today that is what you want to receive God's generosity. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, for those in the room today that are like me, want to be more generous, Lord, I pray you would give us the power to be more generous, God. Pray that today would be the day that we pre-decide to be generous. We put in our budget, seek the kingdom of God first. Lord, and then we just open our hearts and our lives up to who and where and how you want us to spend what you've given. God, we can't keep it. One day when we're with you, we will be held responsible for what we do with what you've given us. God, we live in one of the richest countries in the world and many of us don't feel like it, but God, for those that look in, Lord, we are just so, so wealthy and so I know that for myself and for everyone in this room, Lord, we all will be held to the level of accountability for how much we've been given. So for many, 
who've been given so much, may we be faithful with what we've been given. May we be generous. Change our hearts. Not just to be a one-time giver, but be a generous person. God, for those in the room today that don't know you, that haven't come to follow you, God, you've given them this beautiful gift of salvation. I pray that today would be the day that they accept it. Change their hearts, change their lives, that they may follow you with everything they have. Lord Jesus, thank you for being generous to us. May we respond in generosity. In Jesus' name, amen. This media has been made available by Mosaic Boston Church. If you'd like to check out more resources, learn about Mosaic Boston and our neighborhood churches, or donate to this ministry, please visit mosaicboston.com.